Welcome back to another Conversations with Cabral. Great to have you on here today with our special guest, Dr. Ernesto. Dr. Ernesto is a medical doctor and consultant for some of the leading stem cell clinics in the world. He has consulted with clinics in the United States, as well as Mexico, and currently in Spain. What he's going to go over today is essentially looking at what stem cells are, when it's appropriate to use them, when it's not appropriate to use them, some of the best outcomes of using stem cell-based therapy, as well as areas that you may not want to use them for. Plus, we'll go over some of the legalities inside of the United States and outside of the U.S., what to look for in a clinic, and what the future holds for stem cells. So really excited. I've been looking to connect with an expert on stem cell therapy for quite some time. Uh, Dr. E is what he goes by, and Dr. E for sure is that person. Hopefully you enjoyed today's show. And of course, let us know what you thought. Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner, Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state of the art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Cabral Concept. I'm looking forward to our chat today with our special guest, Dr. Ernesto, or Dr. E, the stem cell guy. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Stephen. I'm really excited to be able to share with you and your audience a little bit of what we've been working on uh, these past couple of years. Yeah, this is an exciting frontier. It really is. I, when I talk about what does the future really hold for be somewhere between natural medicine and conventional medicine, I see the gut microbiome, I see genetics and being able to personalize your genetics, and then I see stem cell therapy. Those are kind of the big three for me, and there's obviously a lot of different branches from those. But I'll tell you, as an outsider to the stem cell field, I consider myself more of an insider for the gut microbiome and, uh, and genomics, uh, but not so much for stem cell therapy because it really is out of my realm. Uh, but that's why, again, I'm looking for, I always look forward to our Thursday shows, but we have not had an excellent expert in stem cell therapy. And uh, that's from hoping you can give all of us a lot more insight here today. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. Where, and uh, just, just so everyone knows, you are based right now in the world. I am currently right now I am in Spain. We've been here for the last 18 months. Uh, before that, we lived in Cancun where I set up and ran a stem cell uh, research facility and treatment center for several years. Uh, then I lived for about a year and a half, year and change in uh, California, uh, also related than working in the stem cell field. So yeah, we've been we've been all over. Right now, I'm, I'm focusing most of my time on, on consulting with physicians in, in, in terms of uh, physician entrepreneurship, but also in patient education. So, um, you know, helping them choose the right kind of stem cell treatments, helping them figure out if stem cell treatments are right for them and uh, being able to refer them when, when, you know, when they, when they qualify it and when we believe it's a, it's a good approach. Excellent. And, and the reason I asked that too is, and I'm sure we'll get into this later in the show, that not all of the treatments available worldwide are currently available in the United States. So I know of people going to South America or, or Panama and in different areas where it is more widely available for better or for worse. And again, we'll get into that. And so that's why with you being working in the US, working in Mexico and also in Spain, it gives us a lot of insight as to how it's being used throughout the world. So for people that don't know what stem cell therapy is, can you let us know what type of therapy it is and where these stem cells coming from sure so when we talk i mean first we need to understand how stem cells work in reality right so we all have stem cells you i everyone listening we've we've got stem cells that's how our body heals that's how we grew up as children that's how you know when we fall down we you know just a very crude uh way of explaining it we fall down we spray you know we scrape an elbow or a knee um we need 
to repair it, those, um, those tissues. And of course, there's some scar tissue, but there's also some regeneration. And it's the stem cells that repair. So basically, and, and the way I explain this to my patients and to the parents of our patients and, and to a lot of my medical students is, and the reason why they're called stem cells is because they really, a, a single cell, and from their stem, they specialize the different tissues. So we have mm -hmm. one common cell, and from there, they start differentiating or maturing into specific families, and then they start branching out into more specialized cells. So it is kind of like when we're children and we go to, we go, everyone goes to the same elementary school, right? We take the same classes. And then as we start moving along, we start understanding what we like and which way we'd like to go. We might have start taking some different specialties, different courses. And af after a couple of years, children who went to the exact same class in elementary school end up being a physician and the other one ends up being a tax attorney, which have absolutely mm. nothing to do, but they start at the same point. Same thing with our cells. We have these stem cells that start at the one specific same point and then they mature and you can have blood cells, you can have muscle cells, you can have tissue, bone, brain, uh, you know, GI, gut cells, all of these different things, they come from the same stem cells. They come from the same origin. And when we say stem cell therapy, it basically means that's the medical process with which we leverage the power of stem cells and we put them in a specific area to achieve a specific result. Because we always have stem cells circulating and they're the ones that identify when, you know, when everything that we're breathing from the environment and it hurts our lungs, we need to replace those cells, right? So it's stem cells that go in there and repa repair it. But when we grab the stem cells, we concentrate them, we put them specifically, let's say in a knee, then we are, uh, that's called stem cell therapy because we're leveraging the regenerative power of those stem cells and we're putting them specifically where we want them. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's a really good uh, way to explain it as well. It's even like, you know, you think of um, a naturopathic doctor or a dermatologist or a psychiatrist, they all do essentially the first two years of medical school, right? It's like everybody learns their oncology, their embryology, like everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, how does that person, you know, end up over there? Well, that's, that's that specialization. So I really like that. That makes a lot of sense um, to me. Now, what are people using stem cell therapy for right now? Like, what are the different areas that we can use this? I know you mentioned about joint-based repair. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about how that works, but then also what else is it used for? Sure. So, I mean, stem cells will help, like we were saying right now, they can regenerate pretty much any kind of tissue because they essentially become that kind of cell population, right? And then repopulate and repair whatever is there. So uh, technically, in theory, they are really repairing anything. You could technically use them for almost anything that has to do with a damaged tissue. So anything that has to do with inflammation, uh, autoimmune disorders, neurological disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, even gut disorders, um, you know, joints, muscles, pain, tendons, all of those things, also for pain management, even for skin disorder, for cosmetic issues. And the thing is, it's not that it's a magic bullet. It's just that it is our body's own repair mechanism. So mm -hmm. we're just, we're just putting it specifically where we want it so that it is it is harnessed in a way that that it does what we want it to do and you spoke at the top of the of the podcast about um, gene therapy or genetic manipulation and and that's essentially the same thing because you're basically changing the code of our cells in order for, to get them to do certain things and when we're talking about stem cells it's a way of grabbing those cells and putting them specifically where you want them that's why the spectrum of things that you can address with stem cells is is so broad. So let's talk about, let's say someone um, is having, uh, they've got a meniscus tear and they've got uh, wearing away of the anticular cartilage around the femur. And so they have got a lot of joint-based pain in their knee. And that, that's very, very common. So would someone be able to, obviously with a medical doctor, inject, would it be differentiated stem cells into the knee? Or would it be undifferentiated? No, you 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 would be treating with undifferentiated stem cells. Um, there are there are a lot of studies. There is a lot of research that's been going on in, in, in differentiating these cells. True, the matter is we're still not that good 
-hmm. at differentiating those cells. We know that there are several factors that if you grab a stem cell and you put them in, you know, you grab a colony of stem cells, you put them in a, in a Petri dish, there are a lot of factors that will determine which way they start differentiating. But we're not at a point yet where we can say, oh, I'm going to start growing, you know, nerve cells or muscle cells or whatever, right? So you use undifferentiated cells. Um, these are adult stem cells, and we can also, you know, later talk a little bit about the differences between embryonic and uh, and adult stem cells. And these are stem cells that you would put directly into the joint, and they would stay right there. You would inject them right there, and the way the stem cells react and recognize what's happening and what's going on is that they recognize inflammation. So when our cells express these different inflammatory markers, the cells in our body, and an inflammatory marker is basically, again, the way I explain this to, to my non-medical uh, listeners is imagine that your cells hold these little signs that say, you know what, I'm damaged, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hurting, right? Uh, when you are in a car accident and you have a flat tire, for instance, you get out of the car and you put your little cones around and things like that to signal other drivers and eventually to signal the emergency cars, right? So mm -hmm. our cells do the exact same thing. When, when there's an injury happening, when they're hurt, when there's inflammation, anything that's happening inside the cell, they start expressing these little uh, inflammatory markers. And the stem cells recognize these inflammatory markers. They go, they migrate specifically to that tissue and they start repairing, they start releasing cytokines, they start calling in for other cells, and, and, and they, they basically trigger the repair process. They control, they mitigate the inflammation, they start recruiting, they start calling other cells into the area, and they start repairing and eventually regenerate the damaged tissue. So that's exactly how it would work. You don't, the, closest, the, the closer you can get the cells to the specifically damaged area, mm -hmm. the more effective it's going to be. But a lot of the times you don't even need to go like super specifically, like microscopically to the same place. You can just put them nearby and they will migrate because they do have that ability. Yeah, and, and I do want to get into that in just a few moments because uh, some of the research on that is, is absolutely remarkable. But what is the success rate look like for being able to use stem cell therapy and other limits to it? Meaning like at some point, if the joint is severely damaged, how much can it repair? Like it's not going to rebuild all of that anticular cartilage. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And you just, you just totally hit it. Um, because what happens is that it will help, remember that the stem cells will regenerate. We're not at a point, I mean, again, in vitro, uh, there are some research of, okay, we can grow ears and we can grow cartilage and we can do all these things. But in vivo, which means basically inside the joint, what we're seeing is that they regenerate, right? But if you have a knee that is bone on bone already, there's no cartilage there left to regenerate. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that the stem cells are going to do at that time is they're going to decrease the inflammation, maybe repair some of these different bones that are already, uh, you know, hitting each other and grinding against each other. So that's that's something very important to to notice. And that is where we need to understand the limitations of stem cell therapy. And that's why... I've been through my entire career, and I was a faculty at the Stem Cell Fellowship for the, for the A4M, um, and I've been working in the field for several years. And one of the things that I always emphasize is just as important as the stem cells themselves is the physician who's administering them. Mm. Because you need to understand the limitations. And in order to understand the limitations, you need to understand the pathophysiology of whatever it is that you're treating, the, 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 the clinical presentation, and all these different variables related to that in order to determine if stem cell therapy is the right tool mm. for that one particular moment. Because that's, that's what stem cell therapy is. It's a tool in a physician's toolbox. The problem is when a physician or when uh, even worse, someone who's not a physician decides that, oh, I'm just going to buy the tool and now I'm going to start curing everyone of everything. And that's, that's where the problem comes. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense as well. How can people, like when are the times to advocate for it, even if it's, if let's say it's available or not available. So uh, let's say someone has a labrum tear in the shoulder or they have a meniscus tear in the knee. Those are, those are pretty common or even in the hip as well. Are those times that, that might, they may see benefit from it? Absolutely. And what we're seeing is that regenerative medicine and, and the more, the more time passes, the more studies are being pushed out and are being published to support 
stem cell therapy or regenerative therapy in general, not just stem cells, but regenerative therapy in general as the first line of treatment mm. uh, for most orthopedic and musculoskeletal disorders because what happens is that it's the least invasive, it's got the best recovery rate, and if it doesn't work, you're still 100% candidate for everything else. Let's say, you know, we spoke a lot about this with uh, with patients, and if you get a hip replacement, if you get a knee replacement, and it doesn't work, and you're still in pain, you're no longer a candidate for stem cells, because there's nothing to regrow there. What are you going to grow a titanium, you know, cartilage? It's just not going to happen. So it should be the first approach. Unfortunately, it's still not covered by insurance, and it's still not very affordable, frankly. But, you know, yes. for, for most people, it should be the first thing they consider. Now, um, are you familiar with uh, PRP therapy as well? Yes, yes, of course. So a lot of people, they have the option to be able to do PRP, but they're confused that I think oftentimes with stem cell therapy. Yes. With PRP, um, you're getting the, the platelet-rich plasma, but I don't believe any stem cells come along with that. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. Um, even, I mean, you do have stem cells circulating your blood, right? So let's assume that you do a blood draw uh, for the PRP and, um, and there are a few stem cells, which are going to be very, very, very small in numbers, but let's assume that there's a few in there. Once you spin it and you separate based on densities, because that's what the spinner does, you're going to grab the platelet-rich plasma. There's no cells mm -hmm. in there. So yes. no stem cells are going to come in there. However, what we do do is that we combine the patient's own platelet-rich plasma with their own stem cells, even when they're allogeneic, when they're like cord blood donor stem cells or anything like that. You combine those before you inject the patient. And the reason you do that is, if you recall, a couple of like one or two questions ago, and I explained how stem cells recognize where they need to go, and it is by these inflammatory markers that the cells express, there are other things that the cells also express. They have their little signs, their inflammatory markers, but they also release cytokines, which is the equivalent of calling 911 or sending a text or sending a tweet, letting people know that you need help, right? And these go out, these are little molecules that go out into the bloodstream and they start calling these emergency repair cells, right? The platelet-rich plasma has those cytokines from the cell. So if you grab the patient's own platelet-rich plasma and you combine it with the stem cells before you infuse it, you, in a way, activate these stem cells so they're already kind of like primed and, and know what to look for. That's why it's very commonly combined. Having said that, that's why I also said the first line of treatment should be regenerative medicine, not necessarily stem cells. PRP is a completely valid method of regenerative medicine mm. uh, component. It's a component of regenerative medicine. So you can absolutely try PRP first. If you go in as a patient and you have, you know, that exact same patients that you said, you have a labrum tear and you go in and maybe you cannot afford stem cell therapy at that time, your physician is not offering it or whatever the reason, PRP is a great first alternative. And you can do one, two, three, four. It's the same thing. You know, you're still a candidate for everything else afterwards if that's not giving you the relief you're, you're seeking. 100%. And that, that is absolutely what I recommend as well, because there's almost no downside, only upside. And there's also no guarantees with surgery. Uh, I know many, many people who have had knee replacements, hip replacements, uh, shoulder-based surgery for the rotator cuff. And they may have fixed one issue, but then another issue arose because of how it was set. Meaning whenever we set things differently, like you said, with a titanium rod in the hip, it's no longer yours. And if it's just a two centimeters off, then you're going to have then some gait based issues with walking and, and the same, same with your shoulder as well. So if people are able to look at a couple of these things first, but I agree with you, unfortunately not covered by insurance right now, uh, they could save themselves a lifetime of pain. The only question I have for you is that with PRP, um, you're probably looking at four to six, uh, sessions and, that is going to be like every week to every two weeks, I believe. Uh, I love the idea of being able to do both at the same time. I and mean, that's really smart to be able to do that if you can. Uh, what is it? How many sessions do you need with stem cell? It depends entirely on what you're treating, the kind of stem cells that you're using, the kind of uh, therapeutic approach that you're utilizing. And uh, in order to address those, you know, if you want, we can go into the differences as to the legalities of it and what's available in the U.S. Because that's that's a real limitation mm -hmm. to delivering 
the best kind of stem cell treatments. And that's why patients in the US who do their research and who need stem cell treatment, they go outside of the US because you simply cannot get the best kind of treatment currently in the US because of the loss and the regulations, which is a shame, but but it is the reality. There are there are several of these uh, different limitations, one of them you know, specifically by the FDA, that they don't allow the the use of stem cell therapy um, in, in, in different modalities. Yeah, and I'd like to talk about that in just a moment. I would like to go over, though, right now, other uses uh, beyond, let's say, joint-based repair, because there are many people and some research going on right now. One of my favorite, re it's obviously, it's on mice, but they essentially, they take older mice and they infuse the blood from younger mice, or they actually connect the two mice, and the older mouse actually begins to take on the properties of a much younger mouse. And obviously, I'm taking this really down to the basics right now, uh, but they are now in the process of doing these same studies. There was a $10 million grant actually given, uh, I believe Peter Thiel is, is uh, part of it as well. I'm not positive, but I believe that he is. And using the blood from essentially college students and infusing it in much older adults, and with the undifferentiated cells, not anywhere in particular, and looking at the different anti-aging pr based properties of hair, skin, nails, organs, et cetera. Could you talk on that a little bit? Because I know that anti-aging is such a big part of this, this uh, field. Well, there are, there are a lot of different components in, in what you're talking about, obviously. Once, once you grab the entire you know, blood as a tissue, has different cell populations mm -hmm. and has a lot of different uh, you know, components besides uh, you know, both cellular and non-cellular. So as we said earlier, we've got cytokines, we've got growth factors, we've got the platelets, we've got the different, uh, you know, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and, and, and a lot of other things that are usually in the blood. But what we're seeing is that, uh, because we used to do a lot of treatments with, uh, with stem cells, is that these stem cells do have that regenerative um, potential. And what happens is that, remember that, once the stem cells go in, they can differentiate and become these particular, uh, you know, th these different um, tissues. But their most important function is that they will trigger autologous stem cell production. So our stem cells are produced in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. We have some circulating. When we need more, uh, there are different signals that are sent through our body and our, our, our bone marrow pumps out some more um, stem cells. There is, there's been a lot of studies done that, that they, have, they have shown unequivocally that patients in their 60s and their 70s, they have a smaller amount of stem cells in their bone marrow, but they still have large numbers of stem cells. The problem is that they're now not as, n not as receptive as at these different stimuli to push them out. So if you do a bone marrow aspirate, which is a great way of obtaining stem cells and you culture those cells, you're going to have great numbers of it. But going back to what, you, to what you were asking, when we infuse younger stem cells into an older person. And these stem cells start releasing all these different growth factors and cytokines and start recruiting different cell populations. They start promoting the release of newer stem cells from mm -hmm. that same person, despite the fact that they were normally not pumping out as many stem cells. Now they start being stimulated to promote and to, to pump out these, to produce and pump out these new uh, stem cells and trigger repair throughout the body. Now, is that because essentially they turn back on the feedback loop? So, exactly. you know, when we, when we get stressed, we're going to then start that HPA uh, axis. So this essentially, as we age, we start to slow or shut down or become a little bit quiet to these feedback loops. Although, whether it be the adrenals or the thyroid and your bone marrow can produce these if correctly given the right stimulus. Absolutely. That's exactly yeah. what we've been seeing. At first, we used to believe that, you know, as you age, the number of stem cells that you produce decreases because the, the initial bone marrow uh, biopsies proved that. They saw, you know, you have X amount when you're young and as you get older, you have less amount. But what we've been seeing is that that 70-year-old um, bone marrow still has huge numbers of stem cells that are viable. The thing is they're just not being pushed out into the bloodstream because of, you know, very well might be that they, we start responding less and less to these different feedback loops. Hmm, it's interesting. It's so it's our bodies really can be this self repairing entity and organism. Uh, it's just there seems to be a code inside of us that begins to 
uh, atrophy and create entropy as we age. But there may be a way for us to slow that dramatically uh, or in the distant future, future, potentially turn that part off. There is, and you're going to like this uh, because it is something that you've been talking about for a while and most people in the community and most of our listeners are familiar with, and it is just leading a healthier lifestyle, making sure that you're exercising, making sure that you're getting, um, you know, uh, sunlight, that you're getting physical activity, that you're, that you're breathing well, intermittent fasting, different fasting protocols, calorie restriction, low carb dieting, all of those things prevent us from developing that wear and tear in our different tissues. And mm. that prevents our stem cells and our feedback loops from not responding. Because remember, and this is something that I always said, irregardless of what kind of treatment we are providing with stem cells, stem cell therapy is not something you do instead of. It's something you need mm. to do in conjunction with a healthy lifestyle. Never, never, it's never the answer to an unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're only compounding inflammation, right? So you just have to do stem cell therapy then your entire life, I guess, if, if that was the case and, and still wouldn't be, still wouldn't be and helpful. And even then, and even then you're never going to catch up. Right, right. That's a good point to make for sure. This is a, this is an add on an adjunct, not a, uh, not a replacement for anything. And that makes sense because all the things you just named, uh, help with, um, telomere. It helps with overall inflammation. And of course, stem cell can be part of that. So, Let's now talk about some of the legalities. What can we actually do? I know that this is a, a global-based health community that we're talking to, people literally all over the world, uh, Europe, Australia, you name it. So now, again, when we're looking at it, many people in the United States, they want to be able to take advantage of this. Better off in Europe, South America, Latin America, where are we able to take advantage of this? And, and in the United States, can we do any of it at all? Yes, yes. So there are there are some stem cell treatments that are available in the United States. So before we actually dive into this, if you if you don't mind, let's just talk a couple of definitions. We have we can divide stem cells into based on what level of maturity they're at. So when we're talking about embryonic stem cells, embryonic stem cells are a big no-no pretty much all over the world, except mm -hmm. in some places in India that are using them. They're the most powerful ones but we still don't know so many things about them. An embryonic stem cell can give rise to an entire new being, mm -hmm. while adult stem cells, they can't. They cannot, on their own, create a new person. Embryonic can, adult stem cells can't. They're still immature in a way. People think that you know when, when you, do, uh, you get the cord blood from a newborn and you're getting stem cells, they, they have a hard time understanding that that it is adult stem cells because yes. they come from literally a newborn but they are adult in terms of maturity right so the adult stem cells are the ones that you would be using in different scenarios the embryonic like i said they do have a lot of potential a lot of power as far as i know they're only being currently utilized in some places in india i believe some places in the u.s in the not in the u.s in in russia um but i probably would not recommend them at this point for any therapeutic applications unless it was like a like a end stage disease and you were like really willing to try them um now when we talk about adult we can divide also stem cells in the source that they come from if they're from the same patient they're called autologous if they're from a donor they're called allogeneic right so mm. most cord blood based treatments are allogeneic because they're from a cord blood donor unless you stored your baby's stem cells and you stored them in a cord blood bank and then several years later you use them for that one same baby in that one case that treatment is autologous but for everybody else would be allogeneic in the u.s the only fda approval for the use of stem cell treatment is autologous so when it, when it is obtained from the same patient, and the sources are usually bone marrow or fat, most commonly is from bone marrow aspirate, and they cannot be manipulated in any way. So you cannot digest any of the fibers if you're doing uh, fat. You cannot modify them. You cannot mix them with PRP. You cannot do any of those things, mm. right? And, and, and here's the kicker. They have to not. They have to be. The treatment has to not be systemic, and the definition of the FDA for systemic is if a treatment affects two or more organs. So it doesn't mean that it has to go in the bloodstream. 
it means that if it is touching or affecting two organs or more, it's considered systemic. That's why you cannot even do like, uh, you know, lumbar puncture with stem cells like we used to do in Cancun because it affects the brain, the brainstem, and the cerebellum and the cerebral spinal, even though it doesn't go through the entire body. So I know this was a little bit confusing, but it's important to understand um, yes. so that so that we can know what's what's allowed. And that's why the most common type of treatment in the U.S. are orthopedic conditions because you go specifically into the muscle, you go specifically into the joint, you go specifically into the one area. That's why those are commonly offered in, you know, by, by orthopedic surgeons, by some chiropractors, which they shouldn't be doing, by some, um, some naturopathic physicians, um, and some pain management doctors, because those, those are the ones that are allowed. Now, there's gotcha. the off labels as well. <laughs> so just a couple of questions there, because obviously we, we went through a lot there. Uh, embryonic stem cells, where, yes. so I, I think probably some ethical and moral issues come around how those embryonic cells are, are being yes. gotten. Is that correct? That's like, that's one of the yes. big issues I'm assuming would be there. Is there an ethical way to be able to get embryonic cells? That's a good question. And um, one that, that, give rise to a lot of misconceptions. Uh, so it's it's important to understand the difference. People think that embryonic stem cells are obtained from an aborted uh, fetus, and, and that's not the case. Embryonic stem cells are obtained by, when you go to an IVF clinic, they fertilize a lot of eggs and they try to implant them. And a lot of times couples don't need all the eggs that have been fertilized. So you can, that those are the cells that they utilize which if they weren't being harvested and used for stem cell treatments, they would be just thrown away and discarded, right? So there is still the ethical conundrum. Personally, mm -hmm. I don't exactly still know which way I would lean on, and I haven't given it much thought, if I'm being honest with you, because I know that there is currently no real therapeutic application that, that, that would be going out to the public. I'm sure that when the time comes, I will personally invest more time into really figuring out where my own ethical uh, boundaries lie, because these are these are cells that are that are going to be discarded one way or another. So they, yes. you know, they might as well. Some people believe that they might as well just be therapeutic for other human beings. Some of them think that no, they just throw them away. So mm. there's the ethical conundrum right there. Yeah, no, it is. That that is a challenging one, and there's arguments on for sure both sides. You know, could those cells potentially life help another life if they're not going to be used, uh, or is that a life? And and you know, so uh, yeah, that's a difficult one. But again, we don't have to even, I guess, go through that right now since you said really it's only in India uh, or so that's that's using those right now, at least that we know about. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I always believe that uh, there's a lot going on that we don't know about, and and uh, maybe our even our own country, but but who knows? So. Another question that I had there is, you know, for me, this was now I have, I have uh, two daughters, six and eight years old. And even for our first daughter, we thought about uh, saving um, and, and being able to utilize placenta and some stem cells, et cetera. But we were we were not confident as to how they were going to be stored and who would have access. And it was because of that, we decided we had to weigh those pros and cons. They're very, very difficult decisions. So we decided at that point uh, not to, uh, you know, and then we could, you, could, you can always play, I guess, Monday morning quarterback and go back. Like, I wish we did. I wish we didn't, but you never know. So right now you really best bet is to be able to say, okay, uh, I'm assuming uh, red, uh, bo I should say bone marrow, uh, is a better place to get stem cells from rather than fats because of the quality and quantity. Would that be correct? Not necessarily quantity. Um, pair, like if you go per CC, there are more stem cells in fat than mm. bone marrow. However, in order to harvest stem cells from fat, you need to do a microliposuction. Have you ever seen a microliposuction? There's scraping, there's yes. pushing, there's tearing, there's injuring tissues, a bunch of cells break. What happens when a cell breaks? They literally spill their contents. And for mm. those who are listening to us right now who aren't uh, in the medical and, and clinical fields, what happens when a cell spills its content is it, it triggers inflammation. That's kind of like the the... the most surefire way to trigger information fast when cells break, right? Mm -hmm. So 
once you have that tissue out, you're going to have a lot of inflammation going on. A lot of cells are already being recruited. And then you have to separate everything that's happening and try to rescue as many cells as you can. So that's that's a tougher process. It 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 got a lot of popularity, especially in the U.S., because when, when the FDA's regulations were still more, they, they had more gray areas, a lot of plastic surgeons, they figured out, well, I'm already doing a lot of liposuction and I'm pulling out, you know, gallons of fat from some of these patients might as well just harvest some stem cells there and then use them. Um, now the FDA has very unequivocally said that that's that's not a therapeutic application despite and I know that a lot of people are still using it. The mm -hmm. FDA has been very clear about it um, that you shouldn't be using it um, for treatments. Now outside of the US, could you use it? Yes, you can. The best way and countless studies have proven it is still the most viable are still bone marrow cells. Got it. That makes sense. And, and one more question around this as well is, let's say that uh, you are able to get stem cells from someone else other than yourself. So do we have to worry about almost like an organ donor, any type of autoimmune based reaction to someone else's stem cells, although they are undifferentiated? There are things you need to worry about, but that's not one of them. Um, because all of these cells, when we get them from cord blood, which is the most common source of these stem cells, uh, you commonly get them from either cord blood or the cord tissue itself. They call it Wharton's jelly. And Wharton's jelly isn't really a jelly. It's more like a solid tissue and they have to mince it before they grab it. But anyway, what's happening is that these cells are going through the placenta right? They're going back and forth between the mom and the baby through the placenta. And what the placenta does, amongst many other things, is it, it, it strips off the different surface markers, that I, the, 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 the antigens that, that will recognize it as, as one person's, because they're literally exchanging blood between mom and the, uh, well, exchange a lot of cells between mom and the, and the baby, right? So the likelihood of you getting a, like, a rejection response from these cells is, is nearly inexistent. However, the one thing that you do need to, to understand and you need, do need to recognize is when you're talking, and I guess you're talking about the different cord blood products that are currently being offered in the US, these off-the-shelf stem cell products from different uh, manufacturers and that a lot of doctors have in their freezers now. And they say, oh, just come in and we'll thaw some stem cells and give them to you. These products have about, remember that I told you that the FDA does not allow manipulation. They don't allow you to, to, to culture these cells. They don't allow you to do anything other than, okay, I pulled it out and I flash froze them and now they're ready to go. What happens is that they are claiming 20, 30% viability. Those are great numbers. They tell, oh, you know, you're buying 30 million cells and they got 30% viability, so you're going to get 9 million viable cells. That's great. That all sounds great. What's the other 70% though? What's going to happen with all those other, you know, 21 million cells that are not viable. Hmm. Some of them are broken. Some of them are simply not viable. So remember that we said when a, break, when a cell breaks and it spills its content, triggers inflammation. What is that going to do to a person who is otherwise healthy? Not much, mm -hmm. right? And this is what we're seeing. A lot of doctors, they get these cells, they test them on themselves because that's what they do. They're like, oh, they sent me a sample, so I'm gonna, gonna try it myself. And they give themselves an IV and nothing happens. They actually feel pretty good because it decreases inflammation and all sorts of things. And then they decide, oh, it's safe. I'm gonna start treating my patients, you know, or some people with multiple sclerosis or with other autoimmune result disorders. What's gonna happen when you give a person with an already overactive immune system 70% non-viable cells? They're probably, you're probably going to start seeing some immune responses. You're mm. probably going to start seeing, I mean, the things that we were, we started seeing were, <laughs> were really shocking. You, you saw, um, you know, mast cell activation in children that they, they brought in because they wanted to treat autism. They suddenly decided they were autis, uh, autism experts, or they wanted to start treating patients with multiple sclerosis, or they decided that they wanted to start treating patients with all sorts of, of neurologic Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all sorts of things. And going back to what we said at the beginning. My personal belief is that as a physician, if you do not treat a particular condition without stem cells, so if it's not in your wheelhouse, assuming that stem cells were not a tool and that particular diagnosis is not in your wheelhouse, you don't have the right to treat it once you get access to stem cells simply because mm -hmm. you have access to stem cells. 
I think that's a good rule. Meaning like, yeah, if you don't have, if you don't have the knowledge base to treat it in other ways, then using stem cells could be more dangerous than it's worth. And it makes a lot of sense. Meaning if you're giving someone, well, if you're putting anything in someone's body, it's going to be detected and it's going to have to either be, well, it's going to have to be removed one way or another because eventually everything has a lifespan. And so that means then your liver, your kidneys, some detox organ is going to have to clean that up. And with so many people already compromised because of whether it be too much adipose tissue, too much body fat, too much processed food, alcohol, drugs, you name it. Um, obviously, then that's going to be a lot more total body burden on the individual. So that's a really good point to look at. Um, and with the mast cell activation, we have many people uh, with uh, mast cell activation um, syndrome in this community. And for them, I could see, I mean, because essentially what you're saying is these stem cells aren't necessarily doing the repair themselves. Their signaling repair needs to take place. And cytokines and histamines are all part of that process. And now you're aggravating to a greater level. So for them, I would say under the skilled care of someone who knows what they're doing, they might do a much smaller dosage. You get used to that. You do a little bit bigger dosage, then a little bit bigger. Would you say that might be the way to go? Yes, absolutely. You can pre-medicate depending on the patient and, and you can use different factors. Now, the great thing about stem cells is, again, remember that the stem cells are smart. They recognize the environment that will release the appropriate cytokines and, and in order to recruit the right kind of cells. That's why we can use stem cells in autoimmune disorders when we have a hyperactive and high inflammation, mm. but we can also use it in patients who are immunocompromised and they will boost up the production of certain uh, immune factors, right? Because they will recognize these and, and do that. But what you just said is key to it. If you imagine a patient who already has a hyperactive immune system, an immune system that's already kind of like a edge, right? Mm. And then you throw in all this, you know, 100 million uh, stem cells out of which 70 million are non-viable. <laughs> How mm. do you expect them to react? Right. Now, now, for those those of us who have been doing stem cells, we hear these stories and we're, we're thinking like, well, what were you thinking? But unfortunately, most doctors... Don't, and I don't want to say most, I don't want to throw everyone under the bus, but but most of these people doing these treatments aren't really thinking things through because they don't fully understand the cell biology. They went to a weekend course that was sponsored by the manufacturer slash distributor of these stem cell products um, mm -hmm. in which 80% of the time they spent in telling them how great their product are, which is compared to their competitors. <laughs> and they didn't really get any clinical training or expertise. And then on the, on the other hand, they decide that because they have stem cells now, they can treat everything. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. I mean, even after, so I remember um, graduated, got my doctor's degree, everything was good. And I'm like, oh, well, I still have a lot more to learn and you would go to conferences. And so now I have the ability to start doing like, let's just say parasite testing. But just because I now have the ability to run a lab with someone to look for parasites or H. pylori or anything else, uh, and I don't prescribe pharmaceuticals because that's not in my wheelhouse, that doesn't mean I should be doing it. Because if I figure it out and I have it and I can't help someone with it and I'm like, oh, just take some cloves or like it's that's not going to help. That's not going to help anybody. So and that doesn't mean again, that just means and the reason why I'm saying that is that medical doctors, uh, which Dr. Ernesto is a medical doctor, that doesn't mean you're trained in medical school on stem cell therapy or how to use this inside of a practice. This is all postdoctoral based work that you should, you know, have studied. And so anybody having this done, you want to make sure that the person that you or clinic that you're working with, uh, obviously that they are experts in this. Yeah. And the stem cell, you know, I always said stem cells are a tool. And how you use them depends on the hands of the person you put them on. Mm -hmm. And when people say, okay, so for instance, if you ask me, what kind of stem cell treatments have I performed? I'll tell you none because I'm on the preclinical side of this whole thing. I've always been you know, working on developing the different therapeutic approaches and then putting together a team of specialists that do these things. So we've treated ophthalmological disorders with an ophthalmologist that's the one that injects people's eyes. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've treated orthopedic disorders with an orthopedist. We've treated uh, neurological disorders with a neurologist and hematologist. And we've treated different, um, different processes with the cardiologist, with the urologist, depending on what we're treating, because that's exactly what you need.
Yeah, 100%, without a doubt, especially when you're looking at this. So we talked about more of the um, hyperactive immune-based response and and um, the different issues that could be created here. But what about a lot of people have the thoughts of, and, and I don't necessarily, um, don't know if I agree with this because you are not injecting in any type of IGF-1 or, or growth hormone, but is there the potential that these stem cells could cause cancerous tumors to grow? Not really, um, especially not when they're when they're autologous. I mean, again, the likelihood is really, really, really s- uh, small. Um, it is something that has to be considered, and that's why you know if you're if you're using certain kinds of cells, and depending on the kind of treatment that you want that you want to use. For instance, we had at at our at our main clinic, we had a contraindication that it was anybody who had cancer, obviously active cancer, or had had cancer in the last five years and was not considered in remission or cured. We wouldn't provide treatment for at that time. Mm. Um, but the likelihood is, is is very, very small, especially if you don't have risk factors, if you haven't had it yourself. If you have had it, then you might want to consider it. And that's when I always tell my story. I've had three stem cell treatments myself, two of them autologous, one allogeneic uh, from my son's squirt blood, and I'm also a cancer survivor, and I mm. seem to be doing fine. So, yes. uh, and I didn't consider that as a risk either. So I weighed the pros, the cons, and I, you know, it's, it's, stem cell therapy is remarkably safe when it's in trained hands. That's right. Yes. Yes. And with that, with that caveat there. So right now it looks like in the United States, uh, it's really in the hands of orthopedic doctors, yeah. uh, just any, any other uses for potential anti-aging, uh, overall besides that legal. Legally, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so legal. So legally, remember that the big caveat here is non-systemic, non-systemic, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and, and and that's that's the most important thing considering the FDA's definition of non-systemic and you know, obviously non-manipulated and all these different things. So, when you talk about autologous, most of the time you're talking pain management doctors and orthopedic surgeons. However. Dermatologists could, and there are some dermatological applications spe- specifically for cosmetic purposes, right? So when you're doing kind of like microneedling and, and kind of like the same thing you would do for a vampire lef- uh, lift, hmm. um, you can do with stem cells and with PRP. Um, you can do kind of like mesotherapy around the scalp, and that does promote uh, the regeneration and regrowth of hair. It's a pricey procedure for that, but uh, but it, it could work. You could use it for uh, for penile enhancement and for vaginal uh, enhancement, the, the the famous, which I don't know if I can say here what the their trade names are because they're kind of they, their trademark, the P and the O. Um, but you could use them for that within the FDA's um, uh, legalities. Now, mm-hmm. the other thing that it, that is important to notice is that the manufacturers of over the counter stem cell products will say that they have FDA approval. They don't. Their products have FDA or their labs have an FDA registration, which means that they basically told the FDA, hey, I have a lab and I'm distributing this product right here, um, but that's it. They don't have an FDA approval to use it for anything. Then the doctors decide based on their clinical experience and their expertise if they want to use it off-label. And technically, it's not even off-label because there's no label yet. Now, uh, one one thing I think I'm a little bit confused on is that let's say you get a an injection in the arm, so it's intramuscular. Not let's not let's not say the joint. How does that not become systemic? We don't know. Okay, so we just don't That's, know where those stem cells travel to, and it's certainly not. So when you get an an IV, we're we're putting that in the vein, so that's a little bit different. But yes. with the muscle, we just don't know how far they travel. Is is that correct? Okay. Exactly, because the stem cells will migrate. Uh, most of them will stay where we put them, but but the stem cells will migrate. I mean, if you put them directly into a capsule, let's say inside a joint, a closed joint, then mm-hmm. sure, they're going to largely stay there. Um, other than that, it's it's really difficult. You're playing a game. I mean, even the FDA is not super clear in their definitions. They're just trying to, you know, between you and I, and just because I'm, I'm in Europe right now, they're just trying to make sure that pharma still has their business and insurance still have their business. Um, because I honestly don't see a clinical reason as to why they are so adamant about halting the progress and the development of regenerative medicine. Yeah. There's simply well, no clinical reason. It, it, and, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that if this does work, and I believe 
it already has been proven to at least to a degree, then that could <clears throat> severely cut down on the amount of medications and different items that people do need. So it makes sense to me. So let's say that people want to use this beyond the orthopedic uh, or cosmetic based reasons. Are there clinics that you've ever been a, uh, that you feel comfortable recommending? Uh, that people may look into. Obviously, this is their choice. We're not making any recommendations. We're not providing any medical advice. Uh, but are there specific places that you do recommend that are doing a great job? For example, just to let you know, like we might say, hey, people can look into the Gerson uh, Plus based clinics in Mexico. They do treatments there that aren't necessarily allowed in the United States. And maybe you're doing that in conjunction with, uh, you know, an integrative uh, medical doctor here in the United States. So, you know, something like that. Yeah, there there are several alternatives, and um, you know I always like to. That's that's exactly what I'm currently doing right now. If somebody approaches me and says, like, listen, I have this, what, what should I do? There are there are a few. Um, obviously, the, the 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 clinic that I helped set up several years ago and uh, that I ran for many years, we set up a lot of the a lot of the processes, uh, you know, in in, in Cancun, uh, Rehealth and uh, World Stem Cells Clinic. Those are very specific uh, treatment centers. So World Stem Cells Clinic only treats children with autism and cerebral palsy and rehealth does provide um, autoimmune disorders and does treat for autoimmune disorders and does treat for neurologic neurodegenerative and mostly for anti-aging we have a very uh, comprehensive protocol for, for anti-aging well we had or we developed I don't know if they're currently still following that particular one um, but there's other alternatives there are other clinics in, in, in Mexico there's there's one in Cabo um, there is there is one in, in Monterey up, up north near the border then there's Panama you've got clinics in Dominican Republic um, so there there are alternatives if you're if you're halfway across the world if you're in Australia there are options in India there are options around here in Europe in uh, Cyprus um, where some of these treatments are being performed and, and what I always recommend people do is reach out to the clinic reach out to the center that you know where, where you're where you're thinking or where you're considering and just just talk to the doctors most of the time you're going to find that it's a I understand why most patients in the U.S. are kind of like hesitant to doing that because they think that they're never going to talk to a doctor. But outside of the U.S., that's that reality does not exist. You get to talk to doctors everywhere else. And the reason is because doctors everywhere else don't have to spend 90% of their time charting and fighting with an EHR. It's not that the doctors in the U.S. are are, are stuck up or, or <laughs> are, are a pain in the, you know, where. It's just that they are too busy with paperwork and with red tape. Um, so if you're Thinking of going outside of the U.S., uh, contact the clinics that you're considering. Uh, a lot of the times they'll have you fill out a, a brief intake form uh, before they agree to, to get on a call with you. And most of them are doing video calls right now where you're able to, once you submit some information and they have some background info on you, that way they don't walk into a call not knowing you at all, uh, but they're able to share with you, listen, these are our expectations. These, this is what we're um, hoping to achieve. This would be a success in our book. Uh, this would be the worst case scenario. This is how much it would cost. This is what your trip would entail. All of these things are addressed in, in those calls before you have to even make a decision. The one red flag here is if they ask you for a deposit before you get to talk to somebody about your condition, run away. Hmm. There's no reason for that anywhere in the world. Oh, sure, just you know, leave a $2,000 deposit and we'll schedule a call with a doctor. That's, that's not how it works. Hmm. That's, that's good advice. And then how long would someone have to spend, let's say, in one of the clinics in Mexico or Panama or, or someone like that? How many treatments over how many weeks or days? Well, different clinics have different protocols um, and uh, different ways of, of getting to where they want to get. And depending on the condition, you might be anywhere from three days to up to a month, some places, uh, depending, again, on the condition that you're seeking treatment for and the kind of protocol that they're following. Standard is usually one to two weeks. Mm -hmm. And you go in and you get the whole treatment. Um, what we created when when I was rehealed, we created a comprehensive year-long package where people would travel down to Cancun four times. And the first time they would get a bone marrow aspirate, they would get we would get the cells and uh, we would harvest and incubate them in, in our incubators there because we have those. So we would grow their own cells. And that one that first treatment was a couple of was one week. And then 
recurring treatments, the ones afterwards, they just had to go down for three days. They would let us know about a week in advance so that we could grow enough cells for a therapeutic dosage. They'd come down, they get the treatment. And that's that's exclusive for anti-aging, so people who don't have other conditions and they're easy to kind of like plan. But again, every clinic, every clinic is different. Every clinic has their own protocols. Remember that this is not an exact science. We're still learning. We're still, you know, working to improve. We're still moving forward. So, you know, we're still changing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why in, when in terms of anti-aging, I think it holds so much potential, uh, but there's so much more to come. And the same goes for gene therapy right now. And the same goes for manipulating the microbiome and the strains of bacteria there. We don't exactly know what happens when you start to introduce uh, certain strains of bacteria for each individual since we have a, you know, we're all humans, right? We all have, the, we all have a microbiome, but it's slightly different from person to person. And what happens when you add someone else's bacteria? So I think these are all things that we should continue to watch for, but at the same time, many people can start benefiting right now and the regenerative or the uh, orthopedic based I can absolutely um, I can't personally vouch for it, but the amount of people that I know that have done it and gotten great results and then were able to mitigate or get around surgery uh, is worth it I mean it really is so that's the first place I would look for but I look forward 10 years from now 15, 20 years from now and what they'll be doing with anti-aging based medicine and stem cells. So uh, I'm happy to hear that we have people like you giving that research and giving that great advice to other physicians that are able to implement this. So th this has been a, a really fun conversation. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much uh, again for, for having me. I always love being able to share what we've been doing. That's what I tell people. Like, listen, I'm so passionate about this, and I'll, I'll just talk to anyone who's willing to listen because it's super cool. <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I just love it. That's great. So how can we learn? I mean, you have obviously so much more uh, knowledge and, and can share so much on this particular topic and others. So where can people find you? I know that you have a podcast. Um, do you have other writings or website? that people can go to? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Dr. Ernesto MD.com and you can find everything there. You'll see the podcast there. You'll see uh, what we're, you know, what I'm currently doing. You'll be able to book a consultation. You'll be able to, uh, like I said, I'm currently not necessarily, not not doing any of the treatments myself. I'm not as affiliated with any clinic, but I'll be happy to talk to anyone. Like I said, I'll be happy to talk to anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about this um, and, and provide a referral where applicable. And uh, I'll be happy to do the same thing for your audience. So just head on over to drnestomd.com and you're going to see the, the 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 links and the right button to click i will link up all of those here today and then are you, are you also on social media as well yes same same handle dr ernesto md on instagram linkedin facebook uh what else is out there i think those those are the ones those, that I'm, those are pretty that I'm much on. it yeah yeah <laughs> that's great anything else uh you'd like to share uh with our audience here today no thank you so much for 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 the opportunity i i really enjoyed myself and uh if anyone wants to learn a little bit more just uh reach out or if, you, if they have questions they can send them your way and i'll be happy to record a, a follow-up or, or the answer to those and then you can publish or share them wherever you see fit no, that's fantastic. Uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom with all of us. I appreciate you listening all the way to the end of the show. And before you go, what I want to do is share with you what is going on right now over at our global health practice, equa.life. That is where all of our health coaching, our protocols, our at-home lab testing, all nutritional supplements, basically everything lives there that was inside of our Boston practice that we've now made a global-based process and practice to open source everything that you could get in a functional medicine concierge practice now open that up to the entire world so we're always excited about being able to share with you what's new what's the latest what's the greatest that we want to be able to bring to people and this week we want to be able to get you a bottle of our daily digestive enzyme this is absolutely one of our most popular products and that is because if you're dealing with bloating based issues slow digestion gas after meals or of course just kind of feeling like a little bit too full after you you eat, an enzyme can help with those particular issues. So right now on all orders over $99, uh, you are going to get a free bottle of our daily digestive enzyme. This is a almost $40 value, yours free on orders over $99. And again, I know many of you uh, took advantage of that uh, minerals and metals based test last week. If you have low levels of minerals on that lab test, uh, you'll know that you're not absorbing all of your nutrients properly 
properly, which is also another great reason to be using an enzyme. Just about a couple years ago, I said to myself, honestly, there's no downside to using an enzyme for me at my whole food based meals. And that's exactly what I do every single day. It's part of my daily foundational protocol level three. And I use it with every lunch and every dinner to break down my food to a greater degree. And again, I want to be able to share that same product with you. So you can test it out yours completely free on all orders while supplies last at equa.life. That's E-Q-U-I dot L-I-F-E. Take care, everyone.